it is uh, great for me to introduce our next speaker, Maxim Yatselev, who is in the same state that I am in, Indiana. It's a great state. Whenever you come to the US, please make sure that stop and visit. Uh, so Maxim will be speaking on L2, uh, best rational approximants to Markov functions on several intervals. Maxim, the floor is Thank yours. Thank you very much, Peter. Yep, uh, I'll be talking about on best rational approximants. First, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the chance to talk about this fork. And I guess I would like to thank uh, Laurent Barachard for introducing me to this topic and actually being a great influence on my career here. All right, I'll go in progression. I'll talk about complex approximation, orthogonal polynomials, and then applications. I'll try to hit all the three topics in my talk. Let's start with an easy, well, well-known, I guess, uh, approximation problem. Well, we have a function f of z, which is analytic at infinity. We can develop it into a power series there, my coefficients of f0, of 1, f2, n, and so on. I would like to find a rational function of type n, n. So numerator is a polynomial of degree at most n, denominator is a polynomial of degree at most n that has the order of contact uh, with f at infinity at least to n plus one, which means when you develop this rational function at infinity into a power series, the first two n plus one coefficients are the same. Uh, we can solve this problem, but the right way to formulate it is actually to linearize the equation and look for polynomials qn and pn in the form such that qn times f minus pn vanishes at infinity with order at least n plus one. If you look at it this way, well, pn is simply the polynomial part of the product qn and f. Whatever q is, you're going to determine the p. And q should be chosen so that the coefficient next to 1 over z to 1 over z to the n vanish. And if you write this down, that's a linear system in the coefficients of q and f. And such linear systems are always solvable. Solution might not be unique, but what's great, if you form this ratio, pn over qn, it's a unique rational function, which is known as the nth diagonal for the approximant. And uh, I'm always going to think of the denominator as the manic polynomial of minimal degree, which makes it unique, non-zero non polynomial, non-trivial solution, of course. Well. Let's now hit orthogonal polynomials. Let's consider a special class of approximation functions. So let's look at Markov function, which simply means I have a positive barrel measure with infinite complex support on the real line, and I take this integral, d mu divided by z minus x. If you go back to the formula that defines the linearized arrow Rn, you multiply this by the z to the power at most n minus 1 that's still going to vanish at infinity with order at least two. So you can apply Cauchy theorem, then you can apply Fubini theorem to realize that denominators of the Pade approximants to Markov functions turn out to be orthogonal polynomials with respect to the measurement. So QN is the nth orthogonal polynomial. So that's our connection to orthogonal polynomials. Moreover, if you have a Markov function, as has been shown by Markov, that the diagonal Pade approximants converge uniformly on close subset of the complement of the convex hole of the support of the measure. I'll be interested not in just in convergence, but in strong convergence. And for that, I need to talk about Zegu measures. So now I have a measure supported on an interval a, b. In my talk, the w of z would be the square root of z minus a, z minus b, with the branch cut uh, being the interval a, b, and the uh, root taken at infinity such that uh, w of z behaves like z. Me uh, let's take a measure mu on interval AB and let's write this uh, decomposition where mu s is a single part, which is single to the back measure, and mu dot is a radomnica dim derivative with respect to essentially the equilibrium distribution of AB. I'm going to write it as dx divided by absolute value of wx. So wx has branch cut there, but the traces from above and below differ by sign, so I take the absolute value that doesn't matter. So I take this that derivative here, and if its uh, log is integrable, then we're going to say that measure belongs to the Sega class. When measure belongs to the Sega class, we can define the Sega uh, function of mu dot. This is simply the integral of uh, 
log mu dot uh, divided by W plus the traces of the square root from above on the cut AP against the Sega curve. Again, it's not important what the formula is here, but what this function does. And that's simply a uh, non-vanishing holomorphic function of the intro AB such that if you take its traces from above AB or below AB, they exist almost everywhere. We take the absolute value squared of them, we're gonna recover the function mu dot. And if you take a measure like that, then we can quantify the convergence of the diagonal for the approximants. All you're gonna get, you're gonna get the Sega function squared divided by the square root function, W and then multiplied by the geometric factor of psi to the power to n, where psi is simply the conformal map of the complement of AB into the unit disk that maps infinity to infinity and has positive derivative there. And I guess uh, we can explicitly write this function, the expression is provided there. So we can quantify the convergence. The geometric factor is given by uh, the conformal map. And then the final asymptotic is captured by the Zegu function squared divided by W. And I'm here, I'm talking about the error of the approximation. Now, let me a bit, uh, make the uh, problem a bit harder. Suppose I don't want to interpolate only at infinity. Suppose I want to interpolate at finitely many points somewhere uh, outside of the interval AB. So I choose my interpolation multi-set. Capital N is the collection of two endpoints. I say it's a multi-set because the, uh, the points are not necessarily distinct. There could be one point repeated two n times. For example, if I choose en to be infinity two n times, I'm going to get back to my uh, classical diagonal for the approximants. But in general, I'll choose some collection of two n points uh, outside of the interval AB, possibly at infinity, possibly uh, coincidental. And I will denote by the capital VN, the Manic polynomial that vanishes at the finite elements of my interpolation set. So if all of my interpolation points at infinity, the n is simply identically equal to one. Otherwise, I simply look at the factor z minus e for all e's in my interpolation set. Now, I would like to find a pair of polynomials, p and qn of degree at most n, such that I look at my linearized error as before, qn times mu minus pn, and then I divide with my polynomial vn. And what I would like now is that uh, this ratio is analytic of the interval a b and vanishes at infinity with order at least n plus one now if all my uh, ens here are fine then i have two n conditions to spend here to make sure that i inter the linear numerator there uh, interpolates denominator for the ratio to be analytic and that pretty much the conditions i can spare there then generically qn has degree n, vn has degree 2n in this case. So the ratio is going to vanish at infinity with order n. And I have one more built in interpolation condition at infinity. You see here because I'm requiring vanishing of order n plus one. So in fact, my interpolation set here, the full interpolation set is this one plus one condition at infinity. But it's convenient for me to separate that condition there. Again, uh, a solution uh, to this linear problem exists. And if you form the ratio of PNOK and it's unique, and that's what we know as the uh, multi point, but the approximate that they're going to denote by n uh, slash n with respect to an interpolation set E. As it turns out, uh, denominators of multi point, but the approximants are also orthogonal polynomials. Only now the weight of orthogonality is uh, mu divided by the polynomial V. And again, we can quantify the rate of convergence. So for the absolutely continuous measures uh, with uh, interpolation set that stay away from AB, that theorem was uh, proven by Wilmer Stotik. Then with some admissibility condition by Kali Yasan and Guillermo Lopez. And in the, th in the form it stated that's taken from the paper of Herbert Stahl. If mu is uh, a second measure on intro AB, ENs are conjugate symmetric. So if the point E is there, the conjugate of E it might be also in the interpolation set and satisfy this uh, Blaschke type conditions. You take uh, the sum over all points in the interpolation set, you map them by the conformal map sign to the unit disk, you take the absolute value and you look at the difference one minus sign. You take all those sums and you take the limit when n times infinity. If all the points stay away from uh, AB, 
one minus psi here will be bounded below by a constant. And of course, this sum is going to behave linearly with n and diverge to infinity. This condition allows you to approach a b if you want with interpolation points. And it's a known Blaschke type condition for convergence of infinite Blaschke products. If this limit is finite, you're going to get actual finite limit. If it's infinite, you, the Blaschke products will converge to zero. And then you can quantify the convergence of multipoint point the approximants. And the behavior is pretty much the same. You have the Sege function squared divided by the square root times Instead of c to the n, you're going to have now this infinite Blaschke product with zeros at the point of the interpolation set. And this condition here specifically tells you that this infinite Blaschke product will converge to zero outside of AB. That's what that condition means. So uh, that's the formula for convergence of multi point for the approximants to Markov functions. Now let's hit uh, the application part. I've been told, I mean, don't take my word for it, that uh, in control theory, there is an interest of approximating L2 functions on the unit circle that are treated as transfer functions by meromorphic functions in the unit disks with L2 traces. Now, if you have a function in L2 of the unit circle, you can write it as the sum of two functions. One is holomorphic in the unit disk, and one is holomorphic uh, outside of the unit disk and vanishes at infinity and both have traces that are L2. Then you write your best a meromorphic H2 approximant. It's going to be a holomorphic function in the unit disk plus a rational function that vanishes at infinity. Then if you want to have best L2 approximation, the holomorphic part of the approximant must match the holomorphic part of the approximant. And therefore we can actually throw away from the problem. And the problem becomes I have a function which is analytic in the complement of the unit disk has L2 traces on the unit disk, vanishes at infinity, and they would like to approximate it by rational functions of type n minus one m. So the uh, numerator is a polynomial of degree n minus one, the denominator is a polynomial of degree n, and all of them have the poles in the unit disk. So the poles are constrained to lie in the unit disk. Now, additionally, I'm going to require here that my functions are conjugate symmetric, which means if I develop them at infinity, the coefficients are real. And so is my approximants have real coefficients in the polynomial uh, numerator denominator polynomial. Then I look for the best L2 approximant on the unit circle, which means it minimizes the L2 norm among all functions in my approximating class. It's known, it's a work by Laurent Barashart and his group that uh, best L2 approximant always exists. It might not be unique, However, it always has exactly n poles in the unit disk. Moreover, this notion of the best total approximant can be generalized to the locally best approximants or even critical points in the L2 approximation. And here, essentially what you do, you uh, look uh, at this problem here as the map from the coefficient to the real line. And then you look for the critical points of this map, you translate them back to rational functions and that's what the critical points are. What's important about this construction is that it happens that the critical points are also dynamically defined uh, multipoint for the approximate. And what I mean by that, if you look the node by Z1 to Zn, the poles of the critical point that lie in the unit disk, you reflect them across the unit circle and you take each of the reflection twice. That's my setting up here. Then, the critical point turns out to be the multi point for the approximant to F corresponding to the interpolation set EN. So, in particular, well, if your approximated function is the Markov function with a support inside of the unit circle, you immediately can apply this formula to describe the asymptotic. Well, first, you need to argue that all the due to orthogonality, all the poles are going to lie on the interval AB. You can apply this formula. However, the drawback is here that uh, the interpolation points are the reflection of the poles. So to describe the asymptotics, you actually, your right-hand side now depends on the approximate. It's not like I, you give me the measure mu, I can produce you the right-hand side that describe the asymptotics. So Laurent Barashart and his group set up to the device 
a better way to describe the asymptotics for the L2 best approximant. And uh, here is what they, they came up with. The Zegu function needs to be replaced by what I will call a condenser Zegu function here in this case. So what's going on? So now my interval AB is inside of minus one one because my singularities needs to be inside of the unit disk. W tilde will stand for the reflection of my square root. So I take the square root evaluated at one over Z multiplied by Z. Then uh, that would be the condenser geometric mean. It's simply the, I again, I'm looking at the Zegu function uh, uh, the Zegu measure. And I would like to integrate uh, log that mu against the one over absolute value w, w tilde with a normalizing constant that turns this into the probability measure. The normalizing constant can be explicitly expressed as a certain uh, elliptic integral. And what this measure is, is simply the equilibrium distribution of the plate AB of the condenser, a interval AB and the unit circle. Then, I can define the condenser Zegu function. The definition is very much similar to the Zegu function. Only now here you have W plus W tilde. You integrate log of the normalized uh, dot mu and your kernel is essentially the reflected curve Zegu kernel. And that's what happens there. Again, what is this function? It's non-vanishing analytic outside of the interval AB and its reflection across the unit circle. It has zero increment to the unit circle and absolute value one there. And it has uh, traces on AB and its reflection almost everywhere. And similarly to Zegu function, you take the absolute value squared, you multiply the by the geometric mean and you're gonna recover the measure, I mean the derivative. And similarly you have a formula for the reflected uh, interval. If you have that, let's define this function phi. Again, I have this normalizing constant and I integrate ds over w, w tilde from one to z. What do I get? Well, I will get the conformal map of the annular domain with the two slits, right? A, B and its reflection onto this certain annulus. The size of the annulus is determined by A, B uniquely as I call the draw here. And that can be related as a phi of B. In this case now, if we take, that's a theorem by Laurent Barashard, Herbridge, Town, Frank Milonsky. So unfortunately, one of the authors passed away and two are in the audience. Uh, if you take now a sequence of critical points and L2 rational approximation of a Markov function, the measure is the Zegu measure on interval AB inside of minus one one, then the rate of approximation can be quantified in the following way. You have your constant, which is the uh, geometric mean. The Zegu function is replaced by the condenser Zegu function. Again, the square root is there. And now the Blaski product is replaced by a much simpler factor. Is simply rho divided by the conformal map raised to the power twin. So that's a much nicer formula, which depends only on the measurement. Now, what I set up to do is to try to describe what happens in the case of when the measure is supported on several intervals. First, let's talk about multipoint for this. So uh, my intervals will be a one, b one, a two, b two, up to a g plus one, b g plus one, all labeled from left to right. I'm going to call this collection delta. W now is the square root of the factors that includes all the endpoints. And my measure, I will factorize this way. I'm gonna look uh, as a row of X divided by essentially by pi absolute value of W now. Well, actually, sorry, by pi I W plus. And if you th think about it, W plus, I W plus is either positive or negative uh, alternately on different intervals. So my function rho is either positive or negative on different intervals. I would like to fix that and I'm gonna fix it in the following way. I will pick M over X to be a Monique polynomial of degree G with exactly one zero in each gap between my intervals. This case, when I take rho and divide by this polynomial M that is chosen arbitrarily, I'm gonna get a function uh, that mu, which is positive on delta now, but it depends on that. I had no good choice of M, so I pick M to be arbitrary and mu dependent on it. And what I will require, not the Zegu condition, but much stronger, I will require that lies in the so the mu dot lies in a certain sobol of fractional space. And it, in particular, it's at least uh, holder one half. 
that the condition there. And that's due to the fact that I use Raymond Hilbert, uh, Delta bar Raymond Hilbert analysis to do this. Then uh, let me describe what's going to happen to the geometric Blaski type factor of psi n first. I would need to, for each point E, which is not on the convex hole delta, I would like to select a polynomial ME, which has degree G, such that if you take ME divided by X minus E times W and you integrate over each gap, you get zero. And if you integrate to a small circle around E, you're gonna get one. You can select such a polynomial and I have explicit integral expression for such guys. And if E is infinity, then X minus E here seems to need to be taken to be one. And the circle needs to be a negatively oriented. And again, uh, these polynomials have potential theoretic interpretation. M infinity divided by W is simply the equilibrium measure on delta and M E divided by W if E is on the real line is an equilibrium measure in the field generated by the delta mass of E. If I select such polynomials, then I can take this exponential and take the sum over all points in the interpolation set of the factors M E of S divided by S minus E multiplied by W, integrate from the leftmost point to Z. So if I do that, what's gonna happen? My function Psi N gonna be analytic outside of the convex hole of Delta, my collection of intervals. There, it go, it's absolute value gonna be less than one. It's going to vanish at each interpolation point with order equal to the multiplicity of the interpolation point. On delta, it's going to have traces that have absolute value one. And in the gaps, it's going to have a unimodular jump uh, with constant that I can give you explicit integral expression. So it's my generalized Blaski protocol. Now let me general write down the generalized Segu function. The first part here is exactly the same as before as in the Segu function. However, if you look at this Cauchy integral, generically it vanishes at infinity with uh, S1 over Z, but W belongs uh, behaves at infinity as Z to the G plus one. So that by itself not, not gonna be analytic at infinity. So you fix the behavior at infinity of your Cauchy integral by the Cauchy integral of constants over the gaps. And you select, you can select constant in such a way that this function will become analytic at infinity. Again, I have explicit expressions, integral expression for the constants. And if you do that, you're gonna create a function which is analytic outside of the convex hole, convex hole of delta. On delta, it has traces. Uh, my measure mu is smooth, so my trace is gonna be smooth as well. If you take the absolute value square, you're gonna recover that mu. But all of the gaps, uh, this function is gonna have unimodular jumps which this constant C mu dot mu k coming in. Now I have functions that have jumps over the gaps, both my Psi and Blaski products and the Segi function, and I would like to fix that. Uh, how I'm gonna fix that? I have the family, uh, a normal family of functions outside of the common form of Delta. They have unimodular traces on Delta, then don't vanish outside of the canvas hold and form a normal family there. In the gaps, they have unimodular jumps that exactly fix the gaps of the Psi N and S. Moreover, they can be meromorphically continued through each gap from above and below. Uh, this continuation is gonna have a pole at each zero of M. So TNs depend on M. Moreover, they're gonna have either zero pole and other one additional point in each gap. Then, I don't give you the expressions, but TNs are constructed and the ratio with certain Riemann theta functions. And this either zero pole, the location of, of those points are determined by the solution of certain Jacobi inversion problem uh, on the double gaps, right? If you form a loop of, out of each gap, that's what Barry Simon calls the isospectral torus. And if the solution of the Jacobi uh, problem lands on the top sheet, you have a pole. If on the bottom sheet, you have a zero if you lands at the branching point is actually nothing. It cancels there. And if you do that, here is the rate uh, of the approximation of by about the point, but the approximate of the mark of function of the measure as described. Uh, convergence will be uniform. Again, you see the Segu function squared divided by W. Now I need to slightly fix it by my polynomial M because my, my that mu dependent on M. You see the Blaski product that give you the geometric convergence. 
and you see the fixing factor here. Finally, what's going to happen if I'm going to do the uh, rational approximation? L2 best. Again, uh, I introduce my reflected W, my square root. So W1 over Z multiplied now by Z to the G plus one. I construct my function phi, which is again the integral of certain polynomial US divided by W, W tilde, where US is a symmetric polynomial of degree to G, chosen so that integrals over the gaps are equal to zero and the integral on delta is equal to I. And I gave you life potential theory uh, U divided by W plus uh, W tilde is the equilibrium distribution of the plate delta with respect to the condenser delta in the unit circle. So what is this function? It's holomorphic outside of the condensed hole of delta in its reciprocal. It has unimodular values on the unit circle. It has an increment of, of the argument to pi. And if you take its absolute values of delta, uh, if you have tra traces and then absolute values are gonna be equal to the constant rho, Whereas low rows is not to turn it about delta, it's simply phi of Vg plus one. And it's essentially the conformal map of the uh, annual domain delta and delta reflected complement of that into the annulus with slits. And again, this guy has uh, unimodular jumps over the gaps. Then I need to define the condenser as a good function. It's done essentially in the same way as I have my condenser. Cosha kernel, I have my uh, weight uh, lambda divided by geometric mean. The same factor here, only now I need to multiply by my polynomial u. And again, I need to adjust it by the integrals over the gaps. I, the next slide is the last one. Today. Over the gaps uh, with certain constants that again, I can provide explicit expressions. Was, what kind of function is that? It's a holomorphic non-vanishing uh, function outside of delta, convex hole of delta in reciprocal. It has uh, zero increment of the argument of the unit circle, has absolute value one there. If you take its traces uh, above and below on delta and you take absolute value square, you're gonna get your weight lambda back. It has the symmetry with respect to unit circle, so you know what happens on the reciprocal of delta and all the gaps, it has unimodular jumps. Here's the unfortunate theorem. And I'll to explain why it's unfortunate. Let's take the sequence of critical points in rational approximation. Let's look at them as multi-point for the approximate. So I need to know the poles. Then let's go back to my previous theorem and solve the corresponding Jacobi inversion problem. And I'm going to get my points x and one x and j in each point in one point in one gap. And man will be the polynomial that vanishes in those points. So I need to know the poles of the approximation. So that's an unfortunate part. Then let's construct the Blaski product over the same points, but selecting only those points that are poles of Tn. So the zeros of Tn are thrown away. And then my density with which I'm going to work now depends on n, and it's my rho divided by polynomial mn and multiplied by the Blaski product square. So I need to know the poles to construct this density. And then the asymptotics provided by the condenser Zegger function of lambda n, then w, which doesn't depend on my approximant, rho divided by phi to the power to n minus dn, where dn is number of factors in the Blaski product. And here again, I have mn divided by Blaski product squared, which means again, I need to know the approximants uh, to do the asymptotics. And that's an unfortunate part. And that one, I have not figured out how to get rid of that dependence on the approximant. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Maxim. We have time for one or two questions. Thank you. Let me see. Is there a question from the conference side? Um. I may have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Max, this is Laurent, so it, it's a nice talk. Um, but do you, for your last result, I'm not sure I got the unfortunate point. Can you repeat what is unfortunate? The asymptotic formula here not only depends on the measure, 
but it also depends on the knowledge of the poles of the approximant RM. So in your formula, here, right? You need to know the density of the measure and that's it. You're gonna get your asymptotic part. That's all you need to know. You construct the condensers of your function, you take the ratio, you're done. I need to know the poles to solve the Jacobian inversion problem to, com to compute MM. And I think we're running out of time here, right, Peter? Uh, yeah. I got you, I got you. Thanks so much. Let's thank the speaker again.